the announcement on chat? Yeah, I will do that too. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, from like from next week, uh, Tuesday on, you will only be uh, able to go into this Zoom chat from your UPen account. If you're if you're using a free account, you won't be able to log into the uh, meeting. So you have to use your uh, UPen accounts from now on. That does not apply to today. That's that's no. started next Tuesday. Next Tuesday, right? Yeah, so, so we make certain that we put that announcement uh, in writing on on. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, 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 I will do that. I will uh, put it on canvas, and I will put that in chat box right, right here. Right. I just don't want to lose anybody by accident. Yep. if I should turn off the light. Well, I don't know. Although it does, it does illuminate my face, which means they can see the expressions very okay, well. well. Take a look at the screen. No, no, definitely not. No. And, and you know you can start any time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I see there's only 41 in the box and the, there's only 41 in there. I'm waiting for the, the bulk of them to get there. This might be it, though. They, it's not. It's not changing that much. It's not changing, says Ozan. He says, "Go ahead." I think I should go ahead. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Share screen. There we go. There we go. Share that one. There we go. And hit this one here. There we go. Now, let's see here. What do we got? It's one. Yeah, that's one there. Okay. Um, today, the word is focused around, I mean, the, the, today's lecture is focused around the word mimic or mimic, mimicry. And um, this is because it's been a very prominent word in uh, field biology because it's something that um, comes to people's attention uh, very soon, as soon as they start spending much time in nature and, and looking at a large number of different species and different organisms. Um, where we work in the tropics, one is left with the feeling that practically everything is a mimic or a model of something. In other words, there are very few things that sort of look neutral. Um, they all look like something, very commonly another organism. Um, and um, it's not 100% true, but it's very close to being true. Um, now, the problem I can care, or the, the aspect of that is that, of course, we use our eyes vastly more than we use our nose or our sense of touch um, or 
other kinds of, of uh, even our hearing, uh, for studying the world around us. Our eyes are exceedingly important because we're diurnal and we're very vision oriented. Um, there are, of course, things that work only at night. So vision is not very important to them. There are also things who live in worlds like caves or underground uh, or inside of tissues where vision obviously is not going to play much of a role in their lives at, at some, at most of the time. But mimicry, uh, and mimicry can involve these other senses. It isn't only vision. Um, and finally, um, biology has focused a lot on mimicry, <coughs> but <coughs> also on this word camouflage, which really just means mimicking something uh, sort of inanimate, something that you don't think of as having uh, much um, relevance to your, to your world. Uh, I looked these two up on Google, and there's 9 million references to um, mimicry on Google, and there's 325 million references to camouflage on Google. <coughs> That's obvious because camouflage is very much involved in what people themselves do on various occasions, whereas mimicry is mostly involved in wild other species. Now, the classic... Hmm, for some reason, we're not going forward here. There we go. The classic species that everybody in North America encounters and thinks of as a model mimicry system is the monarch butterfly. This is practically the, the national butterfly of the United States and um, very prominent, very visible, occurs all over the United States, all the way up to Canada. And um, there it is. And um, that's basically what would be called a model in a mimicry system because it has this butterfly, which looks very similar to it, superficially similar to it, called a viceroy. And uh, there's the monarch and there's a the viceroy side by side. So you can see how similar they are. And you can imagine if these two butterflies were flying, uh, it's actually quite difficult to tell the two of them apart if they're flying happily and not feeling threatened. Uh, I can tell these two butterflies apart 100 meters away if they're being chased because they both have very different flight patterns when they're upset and uh, worried. But if they're just visiting flowers and going around and doing things um, normally, they have very, very similar flight patterns, which says not only do they look alike in the color pattern, but also they adopt, they mimic each other's flight behavior as well. Um, you can see both of these here in Philadelphia. This is the classic model mimicry system with the uh, butterfly here on the right. Um, this one right here, the viceroy uh, being the, the mimic and the general statement would be that this guy is highly edible. And so it gains its protection from looking like this guy, which is viewed as highly not edible. And this not edible piece out here has been known for a very long time, but mostly inferred from the fact that you don't see them with the wings damaged. They're very easy to catch, and, um, uh, but you don't see the, the pattern of, of bird beaks and uh, broken wings and pieces chipped out of the wings like you would if it was an insect that was um, viewed as highly edible by uh, bird predators. That is not the case for the viceroy. Now and then you do see word chips out of a viceroy, meaning somebody has sampled it. Now, Professor Lincoln Brower, who is now deceased uh, at uh, Amherst College, many years, uh, decades back, um, got very involved in this question of, um, do these butterflies taste bad? Because that was the standard statement, was that they, the monarch over here tastes bad. And uh, he would um, put one in his mouth, as have many other people, and decide they don't taste bad. So what's going on? So he raised blue jays, and this is one of them, from nestlings who had never seen a flying insect. They'd only been fed mealworms and other kinds of garbage food, and um, they never have seen a butterfly in their life, right? So this is one of them meeting his first monarch. So I've been given this monarch to eat. The first thing he does is grab it, all right, fine. 
And then what he does is, is, as all many birds do with a butterfly, they rip the wings off. As you can see here, he's just pulled off this piece of the wing here and taking off the rest. The same individual, you can see the tag right here. And uh, so he's de-winging the butterfly. And then he gets it de-winged and he swallows it. So this goes right down. And then all of a sudden, maybe a minute later, he's second guessing himself. Look at the feathers on the body versus the feathers on this body. See, these are sleek and flesh down with the skin and he looks perfectly normal. Over here, he's looking, whoa, there's something wrong. And look at the feathers are all puffed out. His crest is standing up over here. There is something wrong. About a minute later, he vomits the butterfly out. And from that pad on, this blue jay will not touch another monarch. This is exactly the same behavior you did when you were five years old and somebody gave you a pork chop that was partly spoiled and it tasted wonderful. You swallowed it. 10 minutes later, 15 minutes later, you begin to have stomach poisoning and you vomit it out. But the rest of your life, you hate pork chops. And this is a phenomenon, it could be anything. It doesn't have to be a pork chop, of course. But this, is, this learning phenomenon is very well known in animals and very well known in ourselves. Well, that's exactly what the bird does as well. So it turns out that the monarch did not taste bad. What it did was create a, a very strong negative reaction. And it was the cardiac glycosides, which I've already mentioned once before in lecture, in that monarch butterfly, which caused this vomiting reaction. You have the same sensors in you. If you swallow one of these things, you vomit it up too. But it doesn't taste bad in your mouth when it goes in. So you remember this photograph I showed you earlier. This is a horse pasture on the right with horses. This is the same thing on the left with no horses. And um, remember what happened here was that the horses ate all the grass but left the milkweeds. So there's the milkweeds and the horse pasture. And over here on the left side over here, there's all this nice luscious grass. And um, the milkweeds produce this white latex when you rip the leaf off. And that white latex is the food, excuse me, the leaf with that white latex in it, full of cardiac glycosides, is the food of the caterpillar of the monarch butterfly. So not only is the adult monarch slow flying, easy to catch in the air, ostentatious in its color pattern, orange, black, and white. But the caterpillar, look at it, and it sits on top of the leaf, not underneath the leaf. So it's saying to the birds, look at me, look at me, go away. All right? Now the birds, what has been shown with things like the blue jay is they do have to learn. So one, one insect, in the life of a blue jay is, is enough, but one blue jay insect does get trashed by the learning process. We know this for the adults. We assume this for the caterpillars. Nobody has ever actually done it other than to notice that nobody comes along and picks these caterpillars off the milkweeds. They survive their whole lifespan sitting out there on the top of the leaf, eating the leaf, and so on. Now, Lincoln worked that piece out but the other thing that people noticed about the monarchs is that they disappear in the wintertime. They fly away. And it's not that they froze and end up lying on the gutter somewhere. They just get up and go. And then in the spring, they come back. So at that time, 20, 30 years ago, more than 40 years ago, the big mystery was where do they go and where are they coming back from? Well, there's a guy named Fred Urquhart uh, who asked citizen scientists, to return to him these tags that he put on the wings of monarch butterflies in August and September at the end of the summer. So here's this butterfly flying along with this tag on it and somebody in Texas or Kansas or Missouri or Northern Mexico or wherever it is, sees it, collects it and sends it back to Urquhart in Canada. A little piece interesting I just learned yesterday <coughs> about his biology was <coughs> that he was a meteorologist in the, in the World War II, teaching airplane pilots 
about meteorology so that <coughs> he was very interested in distance movement and thought a lot about it. So from his standpoint, that the fact that the monarchs are flying away was somewhat like a plane going off somewhere. So he then, when he got out of the army, he went to work for the Toronto Royal Museum uh, in, uh, in uh, Toronto, Ontario Royal Museum in Toronto, and um, <coughs> worked out this biology as a biologist, even though he wasn't a professional biologist as, as his uh, life profession. So where do they go? Well, after he put all those tags in for quite a while, suddenly got a call from some people in central Mexico saying, hey, we found your butterflies in the refrigerator in central Mexico. There they are. What the butterflies are doing is flying to central high elevation Mexico, clustering together in enormous numbers on tree trunks, as you see here, in self-storage, doing nothing. It's high and cold. It's winter time but it's not freezing, it's not blizzard. It's just high elevation, very cool. Think uh, March up here, or maybe April, excuse me, or maybe late February or early March up here. And they're congregated in enormous numbers. Now, how did they get here? Okay, they got here by flying there from all over the United States. There's another little sub pocket over here on the coast of California and the cold wind coming off of the Pacific Ocean in the wintertime. And um, so the same thing going on here, but the big, the big concentration is right here in Mexico. And um, notice in this contour map of Mexico, here is this ridge running across like that, just south of Mexico City or the vicinity of Mexico City. So I'll go back to it here. And you see that's this ridge going around here. The monarchs end up right about here. Now, biologists have been fascinated by the how, how does the monarch know where to go? Because these were from caterpillars who grew up up here. So mom flew back up here, laid her eggs. The kids grew up, mated, laid their eggs, grew up, closed from the pupae, and then flew back to Mexico. All right. So that's pretty impressive. It's not the ones who flew up from here, flew to there, laid their eggs and turned around and came back. It's the ones who went from here up to there. So how do you evolve a system like that? Ironically, that question hasn't been looked at. And I think the basic reason is that the people who are studying these things are all up here. So they don't really see the antecedents to this down here. What they saw is the, the result of the butterflies coming up here, mating, having a generation, and then going back home. Now, I'll give you a rough outline of how this thing can evolve. It's never been thoroughly studied. You know, at one time, glaciers extended all the way down to about here somewhere. Depends on where you are exactly in the United States and when it was 15,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago, 23,000 years ago. In other words, there, there were several glaciations and they extended different distances in different places. But the point being this, this was the Arctic. Okay. Now, if this is the Arctic, where are the tropics? The tropics are way down here. So this whole range from the temperate zone up here to the tropics would be scrunched down into much narrower bands of, of, of uh, temperature and pushed way down to here. But what we know is this was still tropical. So the Arctic was much closer to the tropics at that time. What we are now seeing in Costa Rica and other tropical elevations is there are a number of different insects who live in the lowlands here, below the mountains having their generation, and when the bad time of year comes, they fly up into the mountains and park themselves in a refrigerator for the bad season. And then when the good season comes along, they fly back down again. Well, if this is a butterfly doing this, as the glaciers retreat and go back this way, 
That means you who were doing this from here to there, here to there, now follow the glacier. So as the glacier retreats, you go further and further and further each summer. And so you're doing really is you're doing this as you used to do probably millions of years ago. And more recently, following the glacier retreat, you now fly all the way up to here and do this thing like you used to do it down here. Right? That's a general overview. Let me show you an example of that. This is near our house in Costa Rica. This is the mountain range here. And these are the cold, wet clouds sitting up on the top during the dry season. So here's the dry season. You can see the grass is all brown. The bees are mostly leafless. Uh, this is the bad time of year if you're a caterpillar eater. And this wasp is a caterpillar eater. About an inch long, it's a predator on caterpillars called Callistes instabilis. And this is a nest. It's a wasp nest. <laughs> you would look at that and you say, whoa, I don't want to go near that. All right. These are the wasps who go out and catch caterpillars, bring them back, feed them to the larvae in their nest. Well, guess what happens when the dry season comes along? They abandon the nest, fly all the way up to here, and park themselves in the refrigerator. This is the insides of a building in those clouds where we were just looking. This is the tree trunks with the hollows and the tree trunks where they used to do their, their, and still do do their hibernating, when there isn't any building in which to, I mean, this is like a super, this is like a super hollow tree from their viewpoint. And this will be about 90% females. A few males make the trip. And then next year, when the rains come down in the lowlands, these guys all get up and all fly down to the bottom, these gals, sorry, and all fly down to the bottom and rebuild their nests. Okay? And then prey on caterpillars and have another generation. And then the next year, they do the same thing over again. But it's very easy to imagine a modern butterfly doing exactly the same thing. Okay. There are other examples of this from Australia, from Southeast Asia, from Africa. Uh, and, uh, and so that's probably how the modern butterfly evolved its trait. Now, with climate change coming on, these clouds are melting because it gets hotter here. And the heat rises. And so it melts these clouds. When it melts those clouds, this gets warmer. So now your refrigerator, which is where you want to stay parked for five months of the year, your refrigerator up here is getting warmer. And when it gets warmer, what happens? The ants who are predators in the bottomlands move up the mountain and into your refrigerator. And here's an example. Here is one of these hibernating wasps right here in the same building. And these are ants army ants who have moved up the mountain following the warming from global warming and are now killing this wasp who because in his mind he's still in the refrigerator. You're not doing anything to even get away. This is the kind of little effects that come about from climate change that are not picked up and are talked about by the big news stories. Now in Southeast Asia, we have a, obviously a monarch relative, the same genus as the monarch, but it doesn't do the things that I just described. It's a more of a whole body, normal, normal kind of butterfly. But notice it still has the same color pattern. And it, that same color pattern says to a predator, don't eat me because I'm in fact full of cardiac glycosides as well. Now, this is one you've seen before that relates to this as well. Uh, but just to emphasize again, the model is the monarch, and the viceroy is the mimic. Okay. This is another one of these things. This is a beetle, the one I mentioned to you before, who feeds on the roots of the milkweed plant. And when it comes up out of the ground where there is no cardiac glycoside, it has to go over here and eat part of the plant to accumulate enough toxin to be a model. Well, this protect itself, of course. That then becomes the model. Here's the tip of the belief where it's chewed off, and this is what it's really trying to get is this pool of latex right there. And the outcome is that now these guys are protected by having eaten it. They then become models. So they are toxic because they ate it, but they're not toxic because they're red. In other words, the red is a warning color, but at the same time, 
even though they had to uh, get their toxin from their environment, from eating the leaves, they are also models for mimics. Uh, here's another one. This is a bug feeding on the fruit of the milkweed. And these are juvenile bugs right here with their mouth parts stuck in, and they're sucking the cardiac glycosides out of the seeds. These are the adults right here, sticking their, their mouth parts in through here to get the cardiac glycosides out of the seed. Now, so those are those are models, those are models and mimics at the same time. All right? Now we're going to see more of that as we go along. I'll change gears here a little bit to show you the phenomenon that we're, we're dealing with. This is a plant, you can see this big leaf right up here that looks like a banana plant. Here is a new leaf which is unrolling, and here's a very new leaf which is not unrolled at all. And then here's a stem running up here like that. Okay. This thing slowly unrolls. So we go over and we open it up like unrolling a map. And inside, on the inside, we see these little beetles, all busy, these beetles eating the edge of the plant. So they're hidden inside this roll. So if you're a bird, you don't know they exist. So you look at them and say, well, okay, there's two species of beetles. But then you see this and you realize, whoa, wait a minute. This is not two species of beetles. This is one species of beetle. So what you do is you take a whole class like yourselves and you send them all in the forest. You say, everybody go collect these little beetles by opening up those rolls. And you lay them out on a tabletop and you discover that on this tabletop are this and this and this and this and this many different color patterns. Look at, look at them, how many there are. Probably what, 10 different color patterns on there. Now, you know you already know from their taxonomy that these are highly edible. And you all know they spend their lives inside those little roll leaves. But they're highly edible. Now, the number one rule of mimicry is that the, mo the mimic should be rare compared to the model. Because if the mimic, mimic is common, some bird will sample it and discover, hey, wait a minute, I'm being fooled. And now these are very ostentatious beetles. And so I'm gonna run around and collect a lot of them and eat them. So the general theory in mimicry is that the mimic should be very rare. But obviously we have a very common mimic here. We have a large number of individuals. So we think about that a little bit and we suddenly realize, whoa, I'll show you the models for these beetles in a moment. But these mimics are much more common than the models are. What's going on? Of course, then you realize that the only time these little beetles are exposed to birds is when they fly from one unrolling leaf to another unrolling leaf, which might be a five or 10 minute flight once every five or 10 days. So from the viewpoint of the predator, these are very scarce. Not only that, there are many different species of them. So the predator doesn't lock into one color pattern and then understand the insect. So from the predator standpoint, you're looking at many species and they're only available for a very short time. So that matches up with what mimics are theoretically supposed to be. But you gotta watch out because there's a lot of polymorphism in nature. When I show you this horse pasture, you do not automatically think, oh damn, there's four species of horses in that pasture. You know perfectly well, that's one species of horse. And this kind of polymorphism is very common. So what you're looking at here is a polymorphic species, which is very different than thinking of a species as being one color pattern with one behavior. These are the models for those little beetles. Now what these guys do is walk around very slowly, very ostentatiously sitting on the tops of leaves and they're horribly toxic. So, any bird that doesn't realize that this is a bad thing to eat will try one. They're very, you know, they're very easy prey, but it will end up vomiting or being very sick very shortly afterwards, and they won't do it anymore. Okay. Here's another one. These are different families of beetles, but that black and yellow pattern walking around on the tops of leaves, not hidden from view, is a very common indicator of being a model. There's a ladybird beetle, which if you are a little bird, you say red, black, and walking. You don't have to look exactly like that. 
you don't have to look exactly like that. <coughs> you just have to be some combination of those things. And the birds do not eat ladybird beetles. <coughs> the ladybird beetles are toxic, just like these guys are toxic, but they make their own toxins, as do these, as do these. So they're not getting their toxins from the plant. Okay. Now this is another kind of a model that's not toxic. So how can it be a model, bright red, very easy to get, sitting on top of the leaf, but it's not toxic. I give you a pair of forceps and you are to pretend you are a small bird. You can play for five hours trying to pick this beetle up with the forceps. You will not be successful. It's absolutely slippery. And you see these big swollen hind legs, one, one right there and one right there. There's a big muscle inside of each of those two legs. So the minute you touch his back, he kicks the leaf extremely hard, which projects him like a projectile off the leaf. <coughs> that is just impossible to catch. And that makes him into a model. In other words, the point being about being a model is that you're left alone. Now, there's a, a little definition we need to add in here. I have just been using the word mimicry. But in fact, in the classical biological community, we have two kinds of mimicry, at least two kinds. One is called Bateson mimicry, and that's what the monarch or the viceroy is. You have the monarch, which is highly toxic, and you have a model, I mean a mimic, which is highly edible. The Batesian mimicry named after a guy named Bates, who came up with this concept in Brazil in the 1800s, watching the butterflies flying around. Then you have Mullerian mimicry, where the mimic is toxic and the model is toxic. <coughs> and so they reinforce each other. In other words, if you're a learner and you have to learn these things, um, the, the, more, the more of the mimics, now you can have as many mimics as you want to because they're toxic also. So everybody looks like everybody and they're all bad. Okay, that's Mullerian mimicry by a different guy named Mueller, uh, who also in the 1800s came up with this concept. And then we have no real word for coral snakes, which we're going to come to in a minute, but just in this context, let me mention here is that coral snakes are generally very venomous to vertebrates. So if you go along and you make a mistake in picking up a coral snake when you think it's a mimic, the concept is you're dead. Well, how can you learn? How can you learn by handling a coral snake? There's all kinds of hypotheses about how, well, maybe it's only a partial bite or you're partially immune or something like that. But none of those things work very well. We'll get to this point in a bit later. Now to show you how Mullerian mimicry can develop, this is one species, one species of butterfly in South America. And how, you know, you find yourself saying, but however can genetics maintain all those different color morphs in the same place? The answer is just they don't. What you discover is you go into one valley in the, in the Andes, and all the species will look like this. You go over the ridge into the next valley, and all of the species will look like that. And you go over the valley, over the ridge to a yet another valley, where there's never a river coming down out of the Andes, and all of the individuals in the species look like this. So yes, this is one species, but everywhere it is, is a mimicry complex which all look like this, or like this, or like this, or like this. So now, if you are this individual right here, and you happen to fly over the ridge into the other valley where everybody looks like this, all the predators look at you and say, oh, you don't fit this, so I'll try you. The concept being, of course, that you, your genes, which had this nice red stripe on it, don't make it in that other valley. Because everybody over there who's bad tasting and the, and the Batesian mimics as well, all look like this. So you're the odd guy out and you get whacked, all right? So this is what maintains each different valley as having a different color pattern. But if you put them in a greenhouse, all these guys can mate with each other. 
no problem. Perfectly fertile organ. It's just like a black horse and a white horse, or a, a pinto horse and a, and a palomito horse. Now, mimicry has sort of evolved through all this in a lot of different ways. Up here in the north, you I'm sure somewhere I'm seeing, seen these white butterflies, white or yellow butterflies flying around. It's called puddling. These guys are sitting on a muddy spot on the side of the road. What they're actually doing is these are all males. They have the proboscis down into the water, into the mud. They're sucking up liquid to get the salt that's in that liquid. And why is there salt? It's because somebody took a pee at that spot. A cow, a horse, a jaguar, yourself, doesn't matter what it is, but there's a lot of urine in here and the urine's full of salt. So the male is sucking up the salt, storing it, putting it in his sperm. And when he mates with a female, she evaluates how much sperm, how much salt there is in the sperm. And if there's a lot of salt, he's a successful male. So she uses his sperm. If there's not much salt in it, she thinks he's a crappy male and she does digest the sperm and harvests the protein from it. So that's what's going on when you see these white butterflies sitting on the roadside. Well, in the same place, at the same time, the same family of butterflies, purity, is this. This guy does not sit out here on the mud and soak up salt at all. He goes to some other plant and suck up alkaloids from the flowers of that plant and uses that in his courtship with the females. His biology is very different because he's a mimic. These white things are saying to the bird, I'm so fast, don't bother to try. He's saying, I'm very toxic, but he's not. He just has a little bit of the, of the toxic compounds in him. And this is the toxic one. That's the model right there. And this one is loaded with the compound that gets out of the plants, all right? This is the same family as the monarch butterfly. Oops, excuse me. This is another family, these white things here, purity. And in fact, if you were an entomologist, you'd look at this and you'd say, oh, I'm not gonna be fooled by that. I can count these in and there are six legs right here. And then I'll, what you would do is you would look at this and you would notice that there's one, two, three, four legs there. This family of butterfly only uses four legs. This family uses six legs, as is the case with all of these guys that are out here as well. Now, this is a Eulerian ring of that toxic thing you were just looking at. See this one right here? And we go and catch all the individuals of different species living in the same place in Costa Rica. And look at them. I mean, you can tell. Yes, you, if you stare at these, you can figure out how to tell them apart. The way the mom and dad tell each other apart, in this case, is by the chemicals that they carry. So each one of these in courtship is a little cloud of different airborne chemicals. They don't tell each other apart by what they look like. This is a Mullerian ring, just like the one we just saw here, with Batesian satellites. So what do I mean by a Batesian satellite? This one right here and that one right there are highly edible. All the rest of these are very toxic. But if you're a bird, of course, you just view them all as the same thing. Now, granted, it's possible even when you're dealing with maybe 200 species of birds here, some of them, might be visually acute enough to actually distinguish one from the other and become a specialist at taking out this guy and not anybody else, for example. That is certainly possible. But in general terms, you're dealing with a big pool of relatively naive predators to whom it's just not a good idea to take in one of these guys and get yourself very sick. Okay. These butterflies, in moth, that's a moth right there. These are butterflies are from all over the map taxonomically, but they've all converged on the same color pattern in the same place. And remember this color pattern, orange, black, white spots. Orange, black, white spots. Orange, black, white spots. 
same thing. The monarch up here grew up evolutionarily in this world and then migrated up to us. So you don't look around you in Pennsylvania and Missouri very much, wondering, are there, are there mimics to this here? Now you've seen one, the Viceroy, you've already seen one. So there is one that evolved, the Viceroy is a northern butterfly. It's no relatives in the tropics at all. But what's happened is the monarch has moved into us up here. And evolutionarily, one of us up here has evolved to be a Batesian mimic of that, if you like, invading monarch butterfly from the tropics. And it grew up in this color pattern right here. That's where it turned into a monarch. Now, look at that. We'll go back to four. What do you see? Orange in the middle, black and white around the edges, and a big chunk of white out in here. Here it is. Here's this one. It's just upside down. This is another butterfly, a northern butterfly, no relatives in the tropics, who's evolved that same color pattern following the monarch. And this guy flies. This, I took this when I was in the army in high school, excuse me, right out of high school in Missouri. This butterfly flies exactly like a monarch. Same pattern. But if you try to catch it, this guy will outrun any athlete in the university. Whereas the monarch, very easy to run down. They don't have the same behavioral capability. And the ancestors of this guy are many northern species who look very different from this. So this guy moved out evolutionarily from the color pattern of all his relatives and became a monarch. But he's highly edible. Okay. This is a wildly different biology. But notice there, he's feeding on milkweed flowers. So he's seen right there in the same place where the monarchs are. So now there are other kinds of being toxic, the same skin again, other kinds of ways to be avoided than by being chemically toxic. And of course, this kind of visual um, pattern is obviously one such way. Um, this is a, an animal that's saying to you, I am a predator, I am looking at you and get out of here if you don't want to be eaten or turn it around the other way. If I don't react to you by getting out of here, I will be eaten. Now, there are psychology classes in other universities, I don't know whether this one at Penn or not, where you wire the whole class to have something tracks where your eyes go when you first see an image. In other words, what is it in the image that you first see and notice and react to? So I'm gonna put a photograph up here. Excuse me, that's the owl that goes with, sorry, that's the predator who goes with that. That's a real predator. This guy's a specialist on insects, okay? But this is the next one. And what the psychologist will show you by tracking where your eyes go is everybody when they first see that thing, they don't see the green over here, they don't see the fence here, they don't see the floor, they don't see the feet, they see the eyes. That is the thing that if you don't notice, if you're not alert to, you're dead. Because if he's looking at you, there's a reason. And he's not afraid of you. Remember, you've been lunch for six million years. And only very, very recently have you moved yourself into a world where you aren't direct lunch. You've seen this photograph before. I just wanted to emphasize it to you again. Here the two hunters are who have just, um, who have just uh, got this uh, very large python and um, brought him in from the forest. And uh, here's the guy, he's one of the two hunters. And as I said the other day, uh, this is his, uh, yeah, this is it's his wife there, uh, one of his daughters here, his son, another daughter. And uh, he lost two children to being swallowed by a snake this size. Uh, I, these are things that you, for six million years, you had to pay a lot of attention to. 
See, there is pattern all over the snake, everywhere. But all of you picked out the eye, which is right there. It's a little different in shape, a little different in color. And if you don't notice that thing, then you have a problem. This is a butterfly who specializes on feeding on carrion on the forest floor. It's right down there at ground level. Now, if you are a small lizard and you don't react to that, or a small bird, and you don't react to those eye spots by fleeing instantly, your lunch for a snake who's on the forest floor. It's very, very simple. Here's another example. This is a tree trunk. And these butterflies sleep here, or excuse me, these moths sleep here in the daytime. And I walk up and I take my photograph and they all are startled by the flash. So they all disperse, they all fly off in all directions. I go on down the trail and come back 10 minutes later and they're all right back in the same place. And you notice that they're not only in the same tree trunk, but they're all clustered together. This is to give a bigger eye spot signal. In other words, you make a bigger signal if there's more of you in the same place with more eyes in the same place. Because what you're doing is you're not locking into a logic process that bird says, hmm, if there's many eyes, that's not really a predator. It's just that the eye spot reacts with a piece of well built in piece of your genome. This is a caterpillar of a very common butterfly, well, relatively common butterfly here in Philadelphia. Those are not real eyes. Those are a color pattern that is hidden when it's being a normal caterpillar walking on leaves and eating leaves and sitting on a stem. This happens sitting on a soccer ball here at this particular moment. And um, so it's disturbed. And so what it's done is, is puffed up its thorax and stretched this piece out. So all of a sudden you see this pair of eyes looking at you. So you're like a little bird in the forest. And if you look at those eyes and you don't split within a millisecond, you're dead. Whether it's an owl or a snake or a monkey, I don't care who the animal is, but the world is full of predators. This is the adult of that butterfly. See one there, one there, and one there. There's three of them. Those are all males, these three yellow things. And visiting this uh, lily here in somebody's garden. And the owner of the garden sent me this photograph saying, Dad, what are all these wings? <laughs> That's the birds that eat those caterpillars. But in this case, they got the adults. You see, there's a male here, a male there, and a male there. There's a male here, a male here, a male here. These are all words. This is all evidence that birds really do catch these things, and they really are a predator. But here's a black one. What's that? The yellow one says to the bird, I'm very fast. I think I can get away. And he often does. They're very hard to catch. For me, they're hard to catch. This black one is the same species. Same species, same place. But it's black with blue on it. That's a female. She's a heavier body. She flies more slowly. She's not as agile in the air because she's carrying eggs and she's looking for a place to lay her eggs as well as visit flowers. This is a mimic of a highly toxic other swallowtail butterfly in North America. So here we have the yellow says, I can, I can outfly you anytime. The black says, I'm toxic. It's the same species. But the one who's the slow flyer, we see this in other species too. It's not just only tiger swallowtails. The one is the slow flyer and easier to catch. Me as a kid with a 14 year old with a butterfly net, these black ones are much easier to catch than these yellow ones are. Looks like a toxic animal. So its model is toxicity. Its escape is being a fast flyer. And if you don't think snakes eat birds, here's right in front of our house. This is a vine snake. He's a specialist on lizards, small birds, up on this vegetation. And here's a warbler that has just been caught and is being swallowed. See, the head of the warbler is right about in here inside the snake is slowly swallowing it. 
This is the boa constrictor with a dove in front of our house. And it's swallowing. You see, here's the head going down right now. Here's the feet up here. This guy is slowly. This is the thing that the dove wants very much to avoid. Now, how is it going to avoid it? It's by noticing. Here's the boa. Look how close he is to the doves. Look, look at this dove. You see the wing up? It's red on the underside. The dove is saying to the boa, I see you. He's also saying to any other dove over there, there's something bad here. Now, why they're willing to get this close to the wall, that's, that photograph makes it look like they're very close. They aren't quite very close. They're just barely striking distance. And this particular individual boa is blind in the right eye. So he's not as secure in his hunting behavior as the other ones are. So I'm not sure what actually he going on. He did not make a pot did not make a pass at this one. But if he had made a pass, he would have bounced off the underside of the wing. So the point being, this predation problem is going on all the time with life. And if you look at them, they're everywhere. Uh, this is a um, moth sitting on tree trunks, living in the daytime, just hanging there like a dead leaf, piece of bark. But if you poke it or you get close to him, it goes down and suddenly, there's the predator. This is what the eye spot looks like close up. These are scales, individual scales on the wing. Imagine the genomics that require that it takes to make that pattern and to select for it. They're like fish scales. They're very, very, very small. I, I tried to find a photograph close up, and I couldn't do it at the moment. Uh, but these are white scales and black scales, and, and you know all the color patterns in it to make this look like moisture and glinting off an eye, which says danger. And when it falls on the ground, so you go from that, same moth, falls on the ground, there's eye spots on the other side. Now there are aposomatic, oh sorry, the word aposomatic refers to being uh, warningly, to translate that out on the street is warningly colored, meaning that it's got something bad. It's not something to eat, it's, to, it's poisonous, it's whatever it happens to be. Well, there are uh, aposematic mammals as well. We don't have to just talk about insects. Um, but um, uh, skunk is one that you know very well. This is right in front of our house again. And uh, why are they black and white? Why is, not, why is the skunk not red and white? or yellow and white, or yellow with black stripes, or something like that. The skunk has been invented at least 70 times in the world, evolutionarily invented. And they're all black and white. No matter what the stock is, it doesn't matter whether it's a marsupial, or a rodent, or a small predator, or a bat. Or, I mean, they, 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 that pattern. Because these guys, because the model, which is this guy right here, the model is Corpuscular means that they're out there at dusk, out there at dawn. And the predators that would eat this, the owls, the hawks, the foxes, the coyotes, most of them are colorblind. So black and white is the most visible thing when you're colorblind. And in the dusk at, at dawn, or at, sorry, at, at sunset and at dawn, red and white is actually, it looks like gray. It's, it's not near as striking as black and white is. Here's another aposematic mammal. It's a roadkill porcupine, black and white. And porcupines have been invented over and over and over again in the world, and they're all black and white. None of them are red and white. None of them are yellow and black or any, anything like that. This is, this is something that comes up over and over and over again. This is a, um, uh, porcupines, of course, are preyed on by all kinds of medium-sized predators, cats, coyotes, uh, canids, um, hawks, owls, all sorts of things uh, would like to prey on them. And they do get the babies now and then. Um, but uh, that color pattern says, you know, don't mess with me. And that's been invented many times by mimics. 
snakes, and now we're back to coral snakes. The thing about coral snakes is you see them in the daytime. They're also out there at night, of course they are. But they just march around in the daytime like they own it. This is, a, this is one in front of our house on a forest floor. Uh, the sunlight coming through, and you can see how bright, how bright that is. Now, there's a, a Nietzsche, an expression in, the, in, the, in, the, in our world, and I'm sure there's one in, in other cultures as well, uh, that it tells you which are coral snakes and which are the mimics. Okay, the, the one that goes for English in the United States is black on yellow, kill a fellow. See that it's black here with yellow on both sides. So you want to try to remember this for a moment until we get to another slide. Black on yellow, kill a fellow. Uh, red on black, friend of Jack. That's the other side of this expression. Black on yellow, kill a fellow. Well. Um, here is one of them in the daytime, and he's right there. This is one of our, our assistants in Costa Rica many years ago, and he's repairing a, a net to put over a tree. Assistant's is sitting out there working, and here comes this coral snake, medium-sized snake, and no other kind of snake would do what this is the coral snake's doing, because they all say, I'm, I'm food for some predator. This guy is saying, I own the world. You know, I, I would be ostentatious, very ostentatious. What may we worry? Nobody's going to touch me. So I just trundle around the daytime. I don't even pay attention to a big mammal up here, moving his hands, moving his chair, doing things like this. So he's not, he's not, he's very casual about the world. Here's one swallowing a lizard that he's just caught. And it's, as you can the lizard is halfway down here, but here's that same old um, uh, color pattern, black on yellow. So here's the black scales and the yellow, yellow scales on both sides. Um, as telling you that it's, this is the genus Microurus, telling you that it's a, a very, it's, it's a real, uh, and this, this venom that he's got has obviously killed or paralyzed uh, this lizard, which he's in the process of swallowing. So I'm at the University of Pennsylvania giving a lecture here decades ago, and I have this photograph of a coral snake from in front of my house. And uh, I show it, I've forgotten what the reason was. And a hand goes up in the back of the room and says, Dan, that's not a coral snake. Huh? It says black on yellow. See? But remember the other Dicha is black on red. Red on black, excuse me, red on black, friend of Jack. This is a coral snake mimic called Lampopiltus, which you may know as king snakes. And if you go to a snake hobbyist exhibition in New Jersey, for example, as we did a number of years ago, you go into a huge big display auditorium and there are hundreds of tables. On each table, there is a small aquarium or several small aquariums. And many hundreds of people with their pet coral snake mimics in the genus Lampropeltus. And they're showing many, many different colors in this one same species. Now, I'm gonna go all the way back There. Remember the South American butterfly? One species, many different color patterns. One species, many different color patterns. There are blue and black ones. There are blue and yellow ones. There are red and blue ones. It's like every combination you can think of, white and red, white and yellow, white and black. And it turns out that each one of these comes from a different place in South America or Central America or the Western United States or the Eastern United States, where there is a coral snake who has that color pattern. And the Lampropeltus has evolved to look like the coral snake, which is the local coral snake. 
So we have one genome, which has just changed over and over and over and over again in this thing, same species. And they all interbreed, no problem at all. And you get all kinds of weird hybrids, of course. And so now this is even is created amongst the snake aficionados, two camps, one of whom argues that you should never mess with nature. So therefore you should never hybridize these things to make different weird color patterns. The other group thinks that's a wonderful thing to do and we produce exotic color patterns. So when you sit at an audience of 50 or 60 people and somebody's showing slides of their coral snakes, you get two totally different reactions by the audience, depending on whether they put up their a real wild coral snake color pattern or a color pattern that is obviously a hybrid between two or perhaps three or four color patterns. So this is where it enters directly into human sort of involvement. And you can, and then of course, on some of the tables in the same amphitheater are the people who sell frozen mice to feed to your coral snakes. So you can have frozen mice delivered to your front door for X amount of money for your boa constrictor or for your coral snakes or for whatever other kind of snakes you have. And um, it's a, a whole subculture of that. But this is the wild version. This is a real one right there. And it looks just like our coral snake, the coral snakes you've just been seeing. Um, these, these guys here, that's the real one from, from our house. And this is the real one from our other real mimic of Lampropeltris. These are very rare compared to the coral snakes themselves. These mimics are much scarcer than are the, um, uh, the models. This is another mimic. And you can see it's the basic thing. Red, black, rings. Red, black, rings. The proof that it's a mimic is that it's sitting there in somebody's hands. Now this is Gerardo's hands, one of my assistants from Costa Rica, who looked at it and said, oh yeah, that's a mimic, no problem. Well, that's because Gerardo knew is this particular one. You don't go around picking them up, postulating that they're mimics, because there are things that look like mimics that are not mimics. This is yet another species, another genus. Um, and uh, you see the same basic pattern produced again. This is a vine snake that lives up in the trees. And, um, but it's a rule breaker. Black on yellow, kill a fellow. It's not venomous at all, but he's actually gone right to the actual relative pattern on the snake. Now this stuff can get really weird. This is a boa constrictor. See the head here? Looks just like tree bark. This is a, a cut, old cut tree stump. Very cryptic. But look at the other end of it. That's the back end of the boa constrictor. It's a coral snake mimic. At the small end, the easy piece to grab and cut off. The other piece, which is the head end, is cryptic. Not only is it cryptic, but now look at the eye. You could barely make it out. This guy is selected to have its eyes invisible because he's a sit, what we call a sit and wait predator. So he doesn't want to be noticed in contrast to those other things that have eye spots that say, hey, I'm dangerous, go away. This boa does not want you to see that he's there. He wants you to not notice him, to think he's a piece of the tree trunk. But it, there is a susceptible end to him. Okay. And then that's the head. This piece right here, well, the head is also susceptible. Somebody, a predator takes him by the head, the predator may win. Or takes off the rear end. A smart primate will take the end off. But this eye spot right here, very carefully colored so that it matches the general color. Incidentally, for those of you looking at the carefully of this, these are wood ticks right here. You see the wood ticks stuck on them. They're sucking the blood of the, of, the, uh, of the boa. This is the one that's blind on the other eye. Now, 
this is, this is the extremities to which, the, the, we'll put it this way, the value of being to, um, toxic as a way of avoiding predation, and then the value of evolving to look like that is very extensive throughout the system. There's a turtle, Ranoclemis pulcherima, and the people who, interestingly, the people who named this turtle are Europeans, and what they named it was the beautiful turtle. Nobody associated this turtle with anything other than being beautiful. What do you see? Now these guys start out the size of a silver dollar. So they're easy for any kind of medium sized predator to eat and swallow. As they get older, this is about six, seven inches long. You can see the color pattern becomes dull and much more cryptic. It looks like leaf litter. But where do you see the bright colors? Right there. When you threaten this turtle, what does it do? Like all turtles, he pulls his head in. And look what do you see. He says, you predator made a mistake. Go away. And there are predators. We flip him over, look at the tooth marks. Now I can't tell you when those tooth marks scars occurred. These of you, the relationship between this brilliant color on the other side here, he's turned over of course now, but it's perfectly possible that this is the bite marks. And in doing this attack, turtle pulled his head in, the predator saw that color pattern, saw this color pattern and said, whoa, I don't mean to be attacking this and dropped it. However, this is the central United States, Michigan, southern Canada. There are no coral snakes at all. So how do you select for this color pattern if there are no coral snakes? Well, this is a full grown adult. The kids are small and they look just like this, brilliant red and black. Uh, and some yellow is here as well. Although there are a number of coral snake species who are just red and black, not red and black and yellow. Well, then you think about where does this turtle live? Shallow swamps, edges of rivers, creeks, low kind of water. And who else lives in that water here? A bird called a great blue heron. It's about waist high on me. And it's a predator who takes frogs, snakes, fish, small turtles, and anything else, a mouse, anything else that gets anywhere near that water. Very accurate, very, very dangerous animal. Great big bird, great blue heron. Where do great blue herons go in the wintertime? They go to Panama, they go to the tropics. Herons are tropical birds, a few of which have moved into the north. Many species of them in the tropics, a few in the far north. They come up here to breed in the summertime when there's a lot of food and everything else is right. So they come up here and they breed just like other birds do. They carry the genome that keeps them alive in the tropics when they fly up to South Dakota, to Minnesota, to Wisconsin, to Ontario, to Manitoba. So up here, they're selecting for this turtle, even though they don't have a coral snake as the thing, the model. In other words, what I'm saying to you is, there's a temporal component to these, modern, these model mimicry evolved systems. It's not just whether you happen to be in the same place at the same time as the model and the mimic. So you can live in one, and other birds, the migratory birds, show the same thing. Now this caterpillar lives right next to our house in Costa Rica. It's great, but that thing is about four inches long, five inches long, bright green, 
very difficult to see in the trees because of the leaves. It's much the same color as the leaves. So it sits up there for about a month, eating leaves, growing up, becoming big like this. This is a high quality food for any, any insectivorous uh, animal, bird, mammal, uh, as a lot of other things, but certainly the vertebrates. Um, this is a very, very high quality food. And uh, it's very cryptic, very hard for things to, uh, to, uh, to notice it, including me. The easy way we find these things is go out at night with a flashlight uh, because the wax on the surface of this caterpillar reflects differently in a flashlight light than the wax on a leaf surface. So this guy is quite visible at night against the green leaf because his green isn't the same green as leaves are. But in the daytime, they're virtually identical. Um, so he sits up there for a month eating away and finally gets full, full grown. And what is he going to go? Where's he going to pupate? He's going to pupate in the litter underneath the tree. So he's 20 meters up in this tree, and he's going to walk down the brown tree trunk to the litter, walk across the leaf litter, burrow in, and pupate. That's going to take him maybe five minutes of a month long life, or maybe. 15 minutes of a month long life. At the moment he decides to do this, without molting, he changes into this. He just sits there and the pigments do this. They go from that to this. He walks down the tree trunk, full of daytime, right in the middle of the day, fully visible, perfectly safe, to the litter, walks across the litter, and no bird would touch him, no monkey would touch him. So, but Jonas, he's taking on this color pattern only for 5, 10, 15 minutes of his life. That tells you something about the value of looking like a toxic animal. Now I'm watching my clock here and I see I have five more minutes. So I'm gonna go back to one slide and elaborate on it, which I wasn't thinking I had time to do. Remember I said to you here that the great blue heron lives in the tropics in the wintertime and then comes up here in the summertime, but he's carrying his genome with him. Now, if you take baby birds in the tropics that are predators on him, big insects and lizards and worms and caterpillars and things like that, and raise them from childhood, from nestlings, just like the blue jay that we saw in the beginning. And then you take this bird who's now an adult, but he's never seen any animal in nature. And you give him a, a thing like a, a pencil stick, something like that, that's shaped like a, a pencil, just a cylinder, a wood cylinder that is striped yellow, black, and red lengthwise. Immediately the bird explores it, picks it, and see if it's something good to eat. If the color pattern is a ring around the, 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 the wooden object, so it's colored yellow, black, and red, ringed in any pattern, but ringed, the bird goes to the opposite end of the cage and cowers and will not eat. It'll starve to death beforehand. I found myself doing this with an African parrot unconsciously by putting in its cage a pine cone that looks like this. Now, what do you see when you see a pine cone like this? You see snake scales. And that African gray parrot immediately decided to be very sick, not to touch his food, and pout in one side of his cage and sit there. We thought he was just gone psycho. You take this out, and immediately he's back to being a normal parrot again. Now, when you take the northern birds, like the blue jay that we were just looking at, and you give them the same experiment of the colored stick that's lengthwise striped or ringed, the northern bird pays no attention. 
because he explores it to see if it's good to eat. Doesn't matter what the color pattern is. But the blue jays don't migrate to the tropics. They do visit the southern United States sometimes. And when they do so, they are in coral snake range, but it's just a visit. It's not living there and that genetic lineage doesn't come from there. Okay. That's the kind of complication that comes from when you start doing some kind of conversation, experimentation like this. And the last one I want to go to is back to our little owl. Yeah. This owl is actually about three and a half inches tall, size of a, um, a salt shaker. It's about, it's about this, this high. And um, I bought him as a nestling in a market in uh, Costa Rica many, many, many decades ago. And uh, so he grew up me feeding him grasshoppers and mealworms. So he had never seen a butterfly, he had never seen any kind of insect in the wild. But he loved insects. So I fed him all kinds of insects, green ones, brown ones, and everything. And I very quickly learned that if I put anything in his cage that was brightly colored, like these butterflies I've been showing you, he just sort of looked at them. No experience whatsoever. He would not go near them. He was genetically hardwired to say, uh uh, not to be touched. And this is an animal that hunts at night, or shall we say in the dusk, night, and dawn. So his color ability to discriminate between those colored things and the greens and the browns and the other kind of the grays and the cream colored things that I gave him was very, very good, even for an animal who's nocturnal, or largely nocturnal. But the same point being that he, this little owl, um, was uh, hardwired, and this is the kind of information that the classical mimicry biology people have a lot of trouble assimilating and accepting, because the entire centuries of studies and thoughts and theory about mimicry is based on that the predator has to learn, and so the amount of time the predator can remember and the naivete of the predator, uh, the youthfulness of the predator, all these things enter, enter in very strongly. But all that work has been done with northern animals. Animals not exposed in their own natural habitats to these brightly colored mimicry complexes. So that's all we have for today. Um, and. Uh, what happened to my little owl is that uh, I did not listen carefully enough to an ornithologist friend of mine who said, don't ever have a pot of water in your house. Well, I went off and left a pot of water in the sink one night and I came back the next morning and my owl had managed to drown himself in my pot of water in the sink. And um, this is after many months of being a very nice little owl. Uh, but he, free, he was lived free in the house and so that, uh, and I, I just stupidly made that mistake. So we'll stop there. And we'll see you next, uh, what do we are next Tuesday? Where we go?